the Chinese economy is certainly facing challenging times, but I don't think that one can count China out. The reason behind that is very simple. It's because China is trying to contain its real estate market from a bubble status. Whether China's economy is collapsing is actually causing a lot of people to sell in recent trading uh, trading weeks, and that actually gave us a great opportunity to increase our investment portfolio with、uh, valuable companies. China's economy has grown two and a half times as fast as the U.S. Any rational discussion taking place would、right. be. Why is China so outperforming the Western economies? What is responsible for it? What does this show about、um, China and the other countries? The most important thing at the present time to do is to increase the profits level in the economy. The Chat Lounge. Chat Lounge. Chat Lounge. The Chat Lounge unpacks views and opinions on hot issues in a more casual way. Welcome to the Chat Lounge. I'm Tu Yun. Joining our discussion on whether the Chinese economy is nearing a collapse are Harvey Zodin, senior fellow at the Center for China and Globalization; John Ross, senior fellow at Chongyang Institute for Financial Studies, Renmin University of China; and Chen Jiahe, chief investment officer of Beijing-based Novem Arcade Technologies. Great to have you back on the show, gentlemen. The Chinese economy has encountered some. Setbacks、um, with the recovery of some key sectors falling short of market expectations, and as the property market is experiencing a prolonged depression, some people are looking to a swan song for the world's second largest economy. Is the Chinese economy really crashing, and what needs to be done to solidify the country's growth? Before we dive deeper into those questions, let me first ask you about your general observation or impression of the current state of the Chinese economy. Shall we start with Harvey, please? Okay. Well, sure. I think that the Chinese economy is certainly facing challenging times, but I don't think that. One can count China out, because China has a very strong leadership, and it's faced、uh, crises before. So COVID pretty much finished. People started traveling.、Uh, they continued to do so, but now it seems that some people are raising question marks about the near future and beyond the near future, like in real estate and local government debt and some more recent concerns like a slight deflation. There's many problems that have been obvious for a, a time, but that said, I've always been impressed with the Chinese government,、uh, how they do their planning,、uh, with Chinese officials, and what they have to go through to get、uh, promoted to high positions of leadership. And I think if past is prologue, I actually predict that the doomsayers are going to be wrong.、Mm. So in this century alone. China had weathered many economic challenges better than other nations. Whether it was the Asian financial crisis of 1997-98 or the global financial crisis of 2007-2008, and now、uh, still running the trade war with the U.S., so、uh, I'm cautiously optimistic. I have to say that.、Mm. Uh, John, do you share similar observation? Well, yes. I'd go much further. I think that the stuff which is appearing about China's economy as a big crisis is, a, I would call it a joke, except it's a dangerous joke. It's the type of type of thing which the United States engages in when it claims the Iraq had weapons of mass destruction in order to launch a war. It has to convey, it has to conceal the real situation. Okay, let's take the facts. Let's take the facts of the last four years. Um, if you take the last four years, the sec- from the second quarter two thousand nineteen to the second quarter two thousand twenty three, which is the latest、uh, data, and you take the total growth, China's economic growth was nineteen point two percent. The U.S.'s was seven point six percent. Italy's was one point five percent. France's was one point four percent. Japan's was zero point eight percent. Germany's was zero point five percent, and the U.K.'s was zero point three percent. That means. China was growing more than two and a half times as fast as the U.S., and the other countries were nowhere to be seen. I mean, Italy's growth, the G7 countries. That's why I took those countries. Italy's growth was eight percent of China's. France's was seven percent. Japan's was four percent. Germany's was three percent, and the U.K.'s was two percent. So, that, and even this understates China's lead 
because that's taking total GDP growth. And that's not taking into account the increase in GDP, which takes place due to population. Now, China has no population increase essentially over this period of time. And actually, 2022, for the first time, had slightly declining population, which means that China's per capita GDP growth is almost exactly the same as its total GDP growth. And on that, China's grown more than three times as fast as the United States. If it wasn't dangerous, it would be some sort of bad joke to say that China's economy is growing three times as fast as the US, therefore the US is in good state and China's in a bad state. <laughs> Does this mean that there are some problems in there are no problems in China's economy? No, there's two I don't identify. I think youth unemployment is too high. But, um, and I think there are evident problems in the real estate industry. But these are small things. It's like somebody having a cold when other people have, you know, got malaria or, you know, smallpox or something. It's just absurd what is being said and there because there are no comparisons which are being made. Well, uh, they uh, those people who uh, like uh, doomsayers, like uh, Harvey just mentioned, probably they um, made such statement because they compare what uh, China's present day performance with uh, what it achieved previously, like in the previous three decades or so. Uh, Jia He, what's your general impression? You know, as the chief investment officer of your company. What are the most tangible changes that have happened in the investment circle so far this year? Hi, I'm glad I can join this discussion. I mean, currently, because I, I, I'm actually investing in stock markets, mm. and in the market, whether China's economy is collapsing, it's actually causing a lot of people to sell in recent trading uh, trading weeks, you know. Mm. And that actually gave us a great opportunity to increase our investment portfolio with uh, valuable companies. But anyway, uh, let me tell you uh, where this uh, impression actually come from. I mean, right. actually, where, where this room actually come from, mm. you know, uh, re regarding whether the Chinese economy is collapsing. It's that's basically because the Chinese economy is not recovering as people have been expecting from the COVID period. Indeed. I mean, uh, uh, from the uh, at the beginning of this year, we were expecting that the uh, GDP recovery rate might reach somewhere between uh, you know 5.5 percent and 6 percent. Now it looks like the growth rate is slightly lower, maybe at 4 to 5 percent. Mm. So people say, okay, you're collapsing because you're short of one to two percentage points of GDP growth. I mean, I mean that's. A bit nonsense, you know. It's only like one to two percent of the GDP growth, uh, and the and the reason behind that is is very simple. It's because China is trying to contain its real estate market from a bubble status. When I was back as a student in Oxford, mm -hmm. you know, I did economic history there, and I studied mm -hmm. the economic history of of many countries uh, around the world. I mean, in the past, like one to two hundred years, and you have never saw a country's economic growth would be very fast when it got the property problem. So when you look at the Chinese economy right now, is that we try to contain the uh, the, the property market, you know, from a bubble status, uh, and and that's been pretty successful in the past two years. I mean, the, the, the increasing trend of property price in cities like Shanghai or Shenzhen has actually been stopped. So that's a very wonderful wonderful thing. But one of the costs would be that, you know, the GDP growth is slightly lower than expected, like one to two percentage points. Uh, but that doesn't mean that the economy is collapsing. I mean, if you look at all the economic sectors in China, property, finance, employment, consumption, everything, I mean, that, there is really no point for collapsing, not at all. Mm. So when this uh, rumor has been spreading across the market, uh, well, personally, I have been, uh, you know, benefiting from that because people have been dumping their stocks at a, a valuation that they can never imagine. I, I've been buying stocks at like uh, 2.8, 2.7 times PE ratio recently. That mm. means less than three years, this company is going to create another company with its profit. So, so that's marvelous. I mean, th that's why value investors really love bear markets because in markets you can buy valuable things at very good prices. Right. You see it as a as a positive thing, but uh, like you've already mentioned, the, some key indicators uh, such as. Uh, Imports and exports, consumer prices, and growth of uh, foreign direct investment did fall short of uh, actually economists or analysts' uh, expectations, and they've shown signs of a decline over the past few months. John, did that meet your expectations? How are you worried over the outcomes? Well, most Western economists who write on China are serially wrong about the question. I mean, I, it's not of, of any interest or importance. All that the fact if, uh, that they think is, if they get the numbers wrong, they had wrong expectations. It shows their expectations were wrong. It doesn't mm. show anything at all about China's economy. 
the question about this is what is it China's relative performance compared to other countries? Mm. And I other because after all, the, the world economy is in a difficult situation at the present time. That is the um, and as I've given you, it's it's growing two and a half times as fast as the United States and 450 times as fast as the UK, if you want to make such a mm. uh, such a, a, a comparison. But it, we'd rather a, compare non- with ourselves, you know, the, our past yeah. performance. You're fine, but I mean, you don't expect the Chinese economy to grow, keep growing at nine percent, you know, for the you know the next fifty years. That's just a wrong expectation. All right. I mean, the the guard, you know, that's there's all. I could go into a long theoretical reasons why, but it, China won't do that. China's got China's goal is to achieve uh, a doubling of per capita GDP by 2035. That's the official goal. That requires a 4.6 percent growth rate from 2022 to. 2035. That is its official target. That, that's what's important. That's what's interesting. That's what's the goals mm. of the people running economic policy. It's not interesting what some person who's been serially wrong about their predictions in China thinks in a Western consultancy. Right. China's target growth for this year is 5%. Will it make it? it it'll be around 5%. Right. Will it make the 4.6% growth up till 2035, which is official target, that China's growth, the goals which is set out at the time of the 14th five-year plan and was set out by Xi Jinping is to double per capita GDP by 2035. You you know, with a, with a, a sheet of paper, you can work out the growth rate that's required for that. It's 4.6%. Will China hit 4.6% this year? I'm pretty sure it'll make 4.6%. It'll get above, above that. Are there any problems? Yeah, there are some. Do you, do you know of any major economy which has got no problems at all? Real estate's a problem. The youth unemployment problem, incidentally, one which may affect the stock market, although one of your guests has got much more expertise on investing than me, is that mm. profits are too low. One of the tra- trends which has occurred is China's profits are no higher the total profits made are no higher than they were four years ago. And that's bad. Now, there's a reason for that. It's part of COVID. And secondly, there are some not wrong ideas going around that what China has to do is to shift great resources into consumption strategically, which would inevitably mean reducing profits. So I hopefully this will be these will be sorted out. But what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to say China's target is 4.6 percent growth. That's the, the government. Some broker in in Washington has, or, or New York to be precise, who knows virtually nothing about China, suddenly decides that the the country is going to grow at seven percent. Well, why? But don't pay any attention to it. Pay attention to what the government says. That's a four point six percent growth rate for the next uh, 12 years. That's what you've got to measure it against. But why did U.S. President Joe Biden call the Chinese economy a ticking time bomb because of the of the troubles it's right now facing, Harvey? And, and this is not just with the U.S. president. As some Indian media also published articles saying that China's economy is kind of collapsing. Because they're engaged in a propaganda I, campaign. Right. Anyway, sorry. sorry for I, I, I think it's a. I think that they're projecting. This is a a wish in uh, the U.S. and uh, India and some other countries uh, that China is on the ropes and pretty soon the West won't have to worry about it. I think it's a kind of envy that China has done so well uh, since reform and opening up that. They're trying to do everything to encircle China economically and politically and bring it down. I mean, last week uh, we saw this uh, so-called trilateral uh, summit where the U.S. basically has sucked South Korea uh, and uh, Japan, a more willing ally, into uh, a triumvirate that's going to uh, further demonize and further uh, encircle China. So I think when uh, Biden made that remark, uh, uh, he, he he tends to have a temper, and I think I think he's angry that things aren't going according to his plan. I mean, if you follow uh, his administration from day one, even though they say it's not China, it is China. They're demonizing China. They're targeting China, and they want to make China weak and meek. It's not going to happen. 
Mm. Jago, do you see such comments um, coming out of anger or, or envy? Well, um, well, I never, I never think that there is anything that China has to do with like uh, you know a bomb or anything. That that's very uh, strange kind of thing because if if you look at what has actually happened in the you know since like 2008 global financial crisis, that mm -hmm. actually gave a really large shock uh, to the global economy. It started from the derivative in the Wall Street. You know that that's that's a horrible problem that has brought almost um, you know any country in the world. But if if you look at the Chinese economy right now, well, as we have just said, there is not much problem with that. It's only it's only dragged slightly because of the property market. Mm. And and there is uh, another thing is that uh, if if you check out how much uh, China is connected with the uh, other countries' economies around the world or other financial markets, say how many people have been investing in China, uh, well, despite the fact that the Chinese market is not having much trouble at all, but even if there is a problem, there is not much foreign capital invested in the country especially if you look at the fixed income uh, market or the equity market, that's about 5 to 10 percent of the holding are actually held by foreign investors. Mm. And the rest, over 90 percent, actually held by domestic investors. So that is to say, even if there is a problem with China, then that would, wouldn't really affect uh, most of the countries around the world, uh, besides the fact that you know, we, we don't really see much risk at all with the Chinese equity market or fixed income market. We, we have been having investing. I mean, uh, our company's family office, we got about 99 percent percent of our or maybe a hundred percent of our portfolio in in stocks you know both in asia and asia oh, mm -hmm. right good to hear mm -hmm. and john you were saying it's propaganda yeah it's it's, it's completely propaganda it's purely propaganda people get the the technique of the united states is well established on major matters is to carry out a technique called the big lie so when it wanted to launch the vietnam war it invented that on that uh, the uh, North Vietnamese ships that attacked American fleet never happened. It just plunged, put out this big lie. When it wanted to attack Iraq, invade Iraq, it put out a big lie that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction, despite the fact that the UN inspectors said it didn't. It pumped out this lie and did it. It's now put out another big lie because it's got to conceal the real situation from its population. Mm. I mean, if you look at the situation, you know, real wages in China are growing about 10 times as fast as real wages in the United States. This would be a disaster for the American population to know. Mm -hmm. China's economy has grown two and a half times as fast as the uh, US. Any rational discussion taking place would right. be, why is China so outperforming the Western economies? What is responsible for it? What does this show about um, China and the other countries and all these types of things, but it can't engage in that type of discussion because it will be forced to admit that its economy is failing in the um, competition, a peaceful competition with China. It can't possibly admit that because it would change the whole political situation in the United States. Therefore, it lies. But Let's you, just call it what its proper name is. What what the things are? As I say, who approach? Let, let me let me. It's rather like the following. Supposing I said. That the U.S. economy, uh, I think the U.S. economy should grow at 10% a year, and it's failed to do so. Okay, you have the Office of Bureau of Statistics of the United States, Bureau of Economic Analysis, is estimate of the U.S. growth rate is about 2%. I take that very seriously. It is about 2%. So what do you, what should we take seriously? The view that the U.S. economy should grow at 2%, which is what their official statistical agencies say, or somebody who says, well, it should grow at 10%, but I'm very disappointed. It's nonsense. You're listening to The Chat Lounge. We'll be back right after this. d a podcast of CGT Radio. We go beyond headlines with reporters from around the world. Search for Deep Dive on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or wherever you listen. Take a deep dive into the news every week. Hear our conversations. Welcome back. You're listening to the Chat Lounge, and we're talking about whether China's economy is collapsing. But we won't make such a prediction on the uh, U.S. economy. But you can't deny mm. that uh, there are some uh, challenges faced by the Chinese economy, right? Like you just mentioned, real estate. Um, then which problem or issue do you see as the most pressing one? The, the most pressing one of all, there's the, what you might call them the, the urgent and the most under, fundamental. The most fundamental is that the 
Econ the Chinese economy has made a big shift into consumption in the last 10 years, and this has inevitably slowed down its economy, and it has reduced profits. And there's a confusion in China about, about what is needed in the short term, which is certainly a consumer stimulus, because in consumption was very much flattened in 2022 mm. um, by the effects of the lockdowns. And I'm very much in favour of a short term uh, consumer stimulus in China in 2023, because the, there's a lot of unused capacity lying around the place that needs to be put back to work. But strategically, the pro problem is that China has reduced its profits by by following some advice of Western or not, no, not following the advice of, it corresponds to a Western model that more of the economy should go into consumption. That's mm. inevitably going to have negative consequences for the economy and it's slowing down. And particularly the profit situation is bad. You've got four years with no growth in profits. The most important thing at the present time to do is to increase the profits level in the economy. Mm. Uh, that's that's, uh, that's why I say, say strategically, uh, say there's a slight difference between during this year and so far the latest data for increase in retail sales is still under three percent okay china can do better than that from point of retail sales so we need a short-term consumer stimulus but the most important underlying thing is to deal with this decline in profits in the economy if that's yeah. done then private investment will recover because that's not going very well at the moment because private investment takes place because of profit, the economy will grow more rapidly and that'll cure the problem of youth unemployment. So the, the key underlying problem is this profits problem. Mm. If there is a problem with the profits, it would be a big problem for investors like Jia He. Jia He, do you see it a big problem or the most pressing issue for China to deal with right now? The, the current thing that the Chinese economy is facing is actually mainly comes from the real estate market. Well, that that would be a serious problem if the Chinese economy, I mean, the per capita GDP is now like uh, 30, 40,000 uh, USD per capita. Mm -hmm. uh, and th at that time, when the real estate uh, market really got into trouble, then we are having a serious issue. And that's exactly what happened to Japan in 1989, mm -hmm. 1990s. Um, because at that time, if you compare the Japanese per capita GDP with the United States, which represented the strongest country in the world at that time, um, the percentage uh, between Japan and U.S. was about 90 percent. So, so that means Japan was almost as developed as the U.S. at that moment. And, and one, it's well, which on the other hand means that uh, its uh, potential for economic growth has been uh, well almost drilled out. You know, but if you look at the per capita GDP of China compared with uh, United States, we're about one sixth of the U.S. So that's about 15 percent. Mm. So, so that means we got a huge potential for economic growth. So at this time, when we are pressing down the property bubble as the government has been trying to do ever since 2020. Mm. Um, so so this actually means we have a, well, a great number of economic uh, growth for the potential to counter this negative effect that is brought uh, by the uh, real estate uh, market. Uh, if, if you check out things like tourism market this year, the consumption, I mean, almost every consumption sector besides the property market has been reviving very strongly this year. But because the property market has been, um, you know, so uh, so strongly connected with many consumption sectors, such as uh, consumption of, of furniture, air conditioner, TV sets, I mean, all these kind of things. Mm. So so if you check out the overall consumption data, that's still slightly growing by about 5 to 6%. But if you check the consumption sector beside the property sector, that's about 20% growth this year. So, so that's very important. Uh, so that's why we believe that the Chinese economy will go through all these obstacles. That's one of the biggest reasons is that uh, the, the economic growth potential for China is still huge because we are only like one sixth, um, you know, the per capita GDP development level of the mature economies around the world. Mm. It's interesting that uh, a lot of uh, Western media or especially those um, specialized in, in economy and uh, finance, they're calling, you know, what's happening in, on China's real estate market as some woe. But according to Jia He and uh, John, it doesn't seem that bad, right? It's kind of squeezing the bubbles out. And to you, it's some sort of healthy process for China's property market. You know, am I correct here? Well, you, you have to look at the China's property market from uh, from three aspects. Mm. Uh, the, the, the first one is that uh, the property price is actually pretty expensive. Uh, if you compare uh, the property price in 
metropolises uh, with its annual rent. In Shanghai, that, that data is about 80, 80 times. Mm. So that, that's very, very high. If you could look at Beijing, that, that's actually much lower, but that's due about 50 times. So in, in economics, we usually say if it's over 30 times, uh, then then it's probably in a bubble status. So we when we get uh, the, the range between 50 to 80, that, that's very high property price compared with local rent and local income. So that's the first problem. There is a property bubble. The, the second is that if if you look at the financial side, I mean, if you consider what has happened back in 2008, uh, that was because there was a huge amount of derivatives uh, existing in the financial market that is closely connected with the property uh, market. Mm. Uh, so when the property market went down back in 2008, and that brought a lot of problem to the financial market and then the economy. But China has actually learned a, a lot of lessons from that experience. Right. And we have well, almost abolished all the uh, financial derivatives in the in the banking sector, the financial sector, and the property sector. So from this point, and we also increased the down payments for individuals to buy their properties. Uh, currently, if you look at the average down payment of individuals in a property market in first tier cities, that's around 50%. And if you remember back in 2008, uh, that was about 10% uh, back in the US. So we would say that the financial risk has been uh, very much limited. Mm. And finally, if you look at whether the government has realized this problem, uh, and the, the answer is yes. I mean, Chinese government has been very well realized about the, the problem of the property market. If you read all, all the documents published by the central government, they have been saying for years that we have to contain the property bubble. Yeah. So, uh, you know, for any crisis, if you are well prepared, then you will not have that serious a crisis. If you look at China's property market from all these three aspects, you find one that is negative and the other two is pretty positive. So, so that, that's what has brought the problem under control. Well, if the uh, property bubbles being squeezed out is a good thing for the market, why did the authorities have to roll out a series of um, measures to support or to revive the property market? If if you look at the the, the, the government's actions um, to the property markets, it, it's it's not something that they say, okay, you have to stop the falling of the property price, or uh, we have to make sure no one defaults. They didn't really say that. What they have been doing is that they try to maintain the market in in order, just make sure it does not collapse. Right. But it is not on the other hand, it is not trying to revive the property market to its uh, previous status. Say, okay, the property price shall be rising ten percent every year. They didn't do this. They want to they want to stabilize the market. So that's a very tricky thing for the government. I mean, mm. it's it's a very subtle action. They, they have to save the market, but they can't save it too much. So that's uh, actually what has happened. Mm, do you see it enough uh, to you know to to support the market? Because we've already seen some um, um, big property companies um, filing for bankruptcy, right? Yeah, well, we have seen some some of the companies fighting for uh, paying back their uh, loans or some of them filed for bankruptcy. But if you look at most of the property developers in the country, that's still pretty fine. And if you check out who has got into a problem, I mean, those uh, these companies are basically the companies that has raised the largest amount of leverage back in the uh, past five to seven years. So, so that is to say, if the company accumulated too much risk, then probably it is a company's uh, liability to to pay what it has been doing wrong. So, so that's a that's a very basic market thing. Mm. And John, from your perspective, uh, do you see you know what's happening in China have any similarities to what what happened in Japan decades ago? Especially, uh, the simple answer is no. Mm. But I'll to expand a little of the, exa- the example, right? Okay. Sure. Japan, contrary to what is generally believed, suffered a huge period of decline in investment. The all this stuff you gain. This is a good example of the nonsense that you write in magazines. I wrote a little article on the Economist. I mean, I'm I'm a great fan of the Economist for the following reason: it's so inaccurate that right. it enabled <laughs> me to make money. Uh, because when I was advising companies, I could easily show that my advice was more accurate than The Economist, which Mm. was singularly inaccurate, particularly on China, and therefore that made me money. So that's that's my opinion of the the accuracy of their types of predictions. So they were saying that all this, a terrible problem of all this infrastructure, building bridges to nowhere. This is not the truth. The truth is that China suffered several decades of decline in investment. Was somebody building a stupid bridge somewhere? Probably, but that that didn't indicate what the general trend is. 
China has not had that. China has, has had a decline in investment, but it's nothing like the decline in investment which took place in Japan. And again, you have simple, straightforward untruths which are said or lies, not to put a finer point upon it. Um, you take, for example, uh, Mark, like Business Week, they say that China has to invest. China's investment is incredibly inefficient. It has to invest several dollars for the GDP to grow by 1%, mm. much more than the US. It's not true. It's factually untrue. China has to invest 8% of GDP to grow by 1%. It's the most efficient, amongst the most efficient in the world. The US has to grow, uh, has to invest 10% of GDP to grow by 1%. People, they just repeat things which are untrue all the time. And you have to realise that. It's one of the problems in China, frankly, is that they take this type of thing too seriously. If it's having an effect on investors in China, um, which it may well be doing, that's because they're, they are doing the, the fallacy of following the singularly inaccurate facts which appear in magazines like The Economist or The Financial Times, and they'll lose money as a result of it. You know, but that's, this is the reality. You know, I used to make my money for many, many, many years by advising companies on countries like Russia and, and China. And the normal way that I used to do it was to take a prediction in The Economist or The Financial Times, which I knew was wrong, say, this is my analysis of the situation. I'll give you this information for free. But if you want my, my analysis a second time round when I'm proved right, you've got to pay me. And that was my, my standard way of doing business. People in China shouldn't take these people seriously. <laughs> Okay, uh, Harvey hasn't been talking for a while. Uh, Harvey, I understand you actually got some concern for when it comes to the Chinese economy, right? Especially about the the unemployment rate of the youth. Yeah, that's right, and it's all been mentioned by my other two colleagues today. Mm -hmm. Both of them right. have cited that as a, a, a challenge. Let's call it, right. and I'm concerned about it because. It's not only a risk to the economy, I think there's psychological aspects as well. You've got so many young people now uh, lying flat or uh, people who are uh, what you call them, uh, full-time sons and daughters who are uh -huh. living at home trying to serve their parents. I think this is a, a huge problem and I think the government needs to address this problem and it's going to be a little difficult at the moment to address it through jobs as we've seen there doesn't seem to be enough jobs at the moment so i think they have to look at other sources so i'm a firm believer in putting those young people to work in a volunteer corps but call it what you want a peace corps panda mm -hmm. corps to go outside the country and to help other countries whether it's along the belt and road or among the BRICS countries mm -hmm. or whatever there's so much wonderful talent in china that's not being utilized so people are not motivated if they were able to go overseas and to help communities like in africa for example let's say, or Latin America, they would gain so many skills, linguistic skills, mm. interpersonal skills, and also problem solving skills that when they came back, they'd not only be much more employable, but they also would have served as kind of informal ambassadors for China. Mm -hmm. You know, Zhou Enlai, uh, your first premier, had this idea of doing folk diplomacy. It's a kind of parallel track to formal diplomacy. And I believe that such a volunteer corps could do exactly that. China gets demonized so often. It really needs the person-to-person -person contact between, let's say, the Chinese young people and young people and others in other countries to see the true picture. And I think seeing is believing. But right, right now, we're subject to so much propaganda, so many attacks. So in short, having a, a place to put young people that'll hone their skills where they can make a contribution to other countries in China, I think would do a lot of good. Mm, I think uh, Harvey just refrained from uh, um, talking about the, the suspension of the release of unemployment data for youths. But uh, Jiahe, you are one of the younger generations. Um, how much or to what extent do you think such factor, the youth unemployment rate, would affect China's economic growth if it's not uh, solved properly? Do you see it a, a, a big issue destabilizing the country's um, economic outlooks there? 
Well, actually, if, if you check out uh, how many, uh, you know, you young people were there in the total labor force in China, I, I, well, I can't remember the data exactly, but mm. I, I think it's about three to five percent. So that's a very small uh, amount of labor uh, below the age of 24, you know, uh, the, the category that the uh, Statistics uh, Bureau has been announcing to abandon this, this time. So it's, so it's a, actually a very small uh, percentage in the very first place. And you have to remember that most of the uh, young workers are actually earning a pre, uh, you know, low wage compared with their older generations. Mm. So that means if you, if you take a look at the total Total salary earned, that's about two to three percent of the total salary. So that's, a, that's a, actually a very small uh, economic indicator. And I think that the reason they have, well, they have actually explained about the reason uh, of abandoning such indicators basically because because it, this indicator was actually set out, you know, decades ago. And that, at that time, not, not all the uh, young people would actually go to college or university. But now things have changed. I mean, a lot of people are now going to universities. I mean, if, if you look at the whole country, the people with a university degree is actually less than 10 percent. But if you look at the younger generation, I mean, people uh, after the year of 2000, uh, they got about, I think it's about 20 to 30 percent of the population has got university degree. Mm. Uh, so that means more and more people are getting educated, which means with the previous statistics uh, rule that they, they didn't actually exclude the people who went to college. They just counted everyone. Mm. Uh, and the people who get employed will be uh, much less because uh, many others are really going to the college. So right. they actually uh, abandoned that, that indicator. Uh, I think that's actually quite understandable, uh, you know, because the, the, the rule is actually pretty wrong in the very first place. And, and also because it's a very small more indicator uh, to the whole economy. And, mm. and if you look at the overall employment data, uh, which counts about 98 to 97 percent of the salary earned uh, for the whole population, and that's pretty stable. And you can see the salary is growing at uh, three to five percent every single year. So, so that's really not a problem. So they, they really abandoned that indicator for, for, for a good reason. But the market has actually put all the emphasis on this news and forgot about uh, every other indicator, which is a very funny thing. Mm, I think that will help eradicate any doubts from uh, maybe Harvey. It doesn't, er it doesn't eradicate my doubts completely. <laughs> I think those data are very good and put it in a proper perspective. Mm -hmm. But I think economics and psychological factors are two different things. And so what I worry about is mm -hmm. that these, even if they're a small percentage, two or three percent of the population, they're among the best trained of the population in China. And they're not productive because they can't find good jobs. I think that uh, if this carries over and they're going to lie flat most of their lives, that's going to not help the Chinese economy mm -hmm. at all. I think it also will help to stabilize uh, China economically and otherwise. Mm -hmm. So I think there's answers to it. And I don't think that these answers have come up have been come up with yet. It doesn't involve training programs necessarily, but I think there are win-win answers, like I suggested about a peace or volunteer core that would be a win-win in every possible way. And I, I hope the government looks at options like that because these people are important and uh, you can't just write them off at a, a single digit, uh, two or three percent, uh, because in some respects, uh, they involve the future leadership of the mm -hmm. uh, country, both uh, in the private sector and the public sector. So I think more attention needs to be played. Yeah, I do think the authorities actually also recognize that um, problem. And that's why they wrote out a bunch of uh, measures like uh, providing job fair for those college graduates and uh, hopefully it can be um, solved properly otherwise yes like Harvey just said it would be um, you know a hidden problem that may have a um, negative impact the chat lounge the chat lounge unpacks views and opinions on hot issues in a more casual way Two other supportive measures uh, the authorities have uh, rode out, especially, you know, this surprise interest rate cuts. So, John, do you see such measures satisfactory or, or enough to help the government to, to rebuild, if you will, um, people's confidence in the country's economy? 
Well, the first thing I'd say that this it's extremely difficult to judge from outside. I mean, I've never run the co- the economy of a country, but mm. London's GDP. When I, I was in charge of London's economic policy for right. eight years, and London's GDP is bigger than than most European countries, so it's not the same. You don't control monetary policy, etc. But I've got some sense, therefore, of how difficult it is to take all these these decisions. Indeed, and you're not nobody's going to be able to st- steer economy of uh, China's size, which is either the first or the second in the world, depending on how you measure it, and make no mistakes in any direction. It's just, just just absolutely impossible to do that. The way I would see the situation at the present time is that consumption is recovering relatively uh, well. Um, it, the, con- the continuation needs to continue for another six months. I don't think you need to stop the consumer stimulus now. Mm. But nevertheless, it's a big recovery compared to last year. The big problem in the economy uh, at an immediate level is the level of private investment, which is falling. The overall investment level is OK. The state investment level is OK. But in the last year, private investment actually fell by 0.5%. And that's a very negative trend. And this is directly connected to the profit situation. Mm. I did the calculations on this. And as of course, was expecting to find a, a strong correlation between the le- rate of growth of profits and the rate of growth of private investment. Mm. But I found the actual correlation is 094 which is almost perfect. In fact, I'd, I'd normally think that if I found a correlation of 0.94, someone was faking the statistics um, because you don't get correlations that are that high normally. But there's no interest in anybody in China faking this particular um, correlation. And that is the biggest problem. And, and unless the private investment occurs, you won't get the economy to grow fast enough. And then you won't generate enough jobs. And much as I, I like Harvey's idea about um, a peace score for reason Um, for you might call foreign policy geopolitical etc and human development reasons but it won't absorb enough of the young people you've got to have a faster economic growth rate mm. for that you've got to revive the private investment and in order to revive the private investment you've got to revive profits within the economy Um, and that's going to be the strategic problem Um, you need a short-term consumer stimulus now and that should continue at least till the end of the year look at the data in December or something, make up your mind. But the strategic problem is you've got to raise the level of profits. If you've got lower profits than four years ago, companies are not going to invest. And that I see as the key strategic problem uh, within the economy. And but, you know, this is this can be sorted out. It won't. You know, I've been following China's economy, you know, writing about it for 30 years. It's not the first time there's ever been any problems and it will overcome them. And it's a very fine matter of judgment to know what they're doing. I think what they're doing on the stimulus, it's to use the Chinese expression, they're crossing the river, feeling the stones beneath the feet. That is, they're taking certain measures, interest rate cuts and other things, and then they're waiting a little bit and seeing if the result is strong enough. So far, the result has not been strong enough, which tends to indicate that they're probably underestimating a bit what needs to be done. And the international trade situation, which was a support to the economy in 2021, for example, is very negative. So I think that everything relies upon the domestic stimulus. So probably they need to do a bit more. All right. Then um, then to our um, investment expert here, John keeps talking about the, improving the level of uh, profit. Jiahe, what's your answer to John? Well, that, that, that's right. I mean, um, the, the profitability of companies would be, you know, the key to investment. Uh, what, what John has been saying is what's important for companies. Yes, I mean, they, they have to increase the investments. They have to increase the profit. Uh, that That's a very uh, critical thing if you talk about this from the you know, the, the business operation level. But it, when we are talking about investment here, because uh, I invest in the stock market, mm-hmm. um, what's even more important is actually how much uh, that you can bet uh, that everyone else is not recognizing. Okay, so so if everyone knows this company's profit is going to rise up in the future, and the market is going to give it a very high valuation in most cases, and, and that means you're not really making money because everyone else knows that. So if you look at the Chinese situation right now, is that some of the companies are really uh, in their low profitability 
uh, era compared with like uh, five or ten years ago. Mm. For example, the banks uh, currently most of the large banks in China are earning a return on equity at about ten percent, uh, which is not really low if you compare that with banks in like Wells Fargo or Standard Chartered. Uh, but if you look back, uh, well, one decade or fifteen years ago, the return on equity for most of the large banks was around eighteen to twenty percent. So, so from this point of view, yeah, I mean the profitability is low right now, but also the market thinks that it's going to be even worse. So they give it a really low valuation for all these companies, which means if you are an investor like me, you try to find the mismatch over here. Uh, so if, if you can find some companies with like three to four times PE ratio, then that actually means the market has been underpricing it too much. So you can still make profit from it as long as the company keeps on going forever. You know, and if you look at many of the state owned companies or large private companies you can see how they will be you know two decades from now they will still be very good companies in china and they are offering by the market at like three to four times p ratio yeah i mean you can buy them uh, regardless of where the profit will go in the next in, in the next two or three years mm, then do, do you think um the authorities they need any more stimulus package or plans like uh, john just mentioned well, currently what China has been doing is that they try to, uh, well, the authorities try not to give an overall stimulus mm. into the into the economy because uh, it has been proved by our economic history in the past two decades that if you pump a lot of money into the market, it, it can either go to the property market and push the price up by 30% in just one year, or it can go to the stock market and you can have a like 100% rebound in just three months time, like what actually happened uh, in the end of 2014 you know the Shanghai composite index increased by like 150 percent in just the three months time mm. so so you don't want that you know if you pump a lot of money into the market you might just get that again that's really um, not a very good thing I mean it's not a very good thing for the economy it's not a very good thing for the stability of the market even for many investors it's not a good thing because the market has been rising too much in too short a period of time and mm. a lot of people just come in when the market has been going up by like hundred uh, percent and they buy at the top of the hills, you know, uh, at a very expensive valuation, and they lose money afterward. So, I mean, history has taught us that pumping a lot of money into the economy uh, once in a while is not a good idea. Mm. So what China is actually doing right now is giving very subtle support to uh, each uh, unique industries and setting a lot of, uh, you know, detailed industrial um, industrial stimulation plans to help each industry, um, each company, and, and that's a very uh, subtle thing to to be talked about in just a few minutes. You know, it's 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 a lot of things that has been published by the central government. Mm. But ask people in many industries, they, they can see there has been a lot of supports. I mean, for example, I, I'm in Hainan province right now. Hainan province has been very famous for its tourism industry. And the government has been given a lot of uh, tourism support to this uh, little province that has only like 10 million population. It's a very small province in China. But there has been a lot of uh, policies coming directly from the central government to this province to help with its agriculture, with its tourism, with this building of the financial center, these kind of things. So, I mean, that's why China tried to move away from, you know, pumping a lot of money into the economy and just let it be to a more subtle way of stimulating all the industries. Mm, John, what's the stimulus you're talking about? Do you agree with uh, Jiahe there? I I would have a slightly different take on it, um, probably because I'm looking at it from the point of macroeconomics and not not investment in particular companies, and they're two different things. What is important is what what is the effect on the overall economic growth, not are there any problems. Almost any policy will create problems somewhere. The question is, what is the overall effect? And the overall effect at the present time is I think the economy is growing a bit too slowly, not massively too slowly. But the the indicators of that are the consumer price index is actually mildly negative. The producer price index is considerably negative. This tends to indicate, therefore, that what is happening is there is demand is weak compared to supply. It's not clear that the 5% target will be hit this year. I mean, I'm not saying it won't be hit, the 5% growth target, but it, it may not be hit. So, and therefore, I think a bit of stimulus is required in the situation. One which is going on is the consumer stimulus. 
Um, I think there needs to be some in, increase in infrastructure investment um, in the situation. And in particular, we need to get rid of this confused idea that what you've got to do is increase the percentage of consumption in the economy. Because people get confused about two different things. They talk about increasing consumption, but these are, there's two different things. One is, what is the percentage increase in consumption? That's important to people's living standards. Uh, what is the percentage of consumption in the economy? It's completely irrelevant to their living standards. But the problem is that the two move in opposite directions. The higher the percentage of statistics show clearly, as does economic theory, the higher the percentage of the economy which is devoted to consumption, the slower consumption will grow. And what should be being targeted, therefore, is what is the rate of growth of consumption? Not because I read the Chinese media a great deal and also read the Western media, not what is the con level of consumption in GDP. The level of consumption in Chinese GDP has been increased very much with the entirely predictable result that the rate of growth of consumption has slowed down. So I think you need a, a mild stimulus, not one like in 2008 to avoid any confusion, mm. but a bit a bit of stimulus focused on consumption and on the question of infrastructure investment. Right. It's just about the uh, the amount, I guess, you were talking about, right? It's not a huge amount, but uh, we need some maybe moderate stimulus. Yeah, that, that would be the rational, go back to starting point of the program, that would be mm -hmm. the rational discussion. The rational discussion would be, look, overall in international comparisons, China's economy is doing very well. It's growing two and a half times as fast as the US, but it could grow possibly a bit faster. Should there be a bit more mm. or stimulus or is the level of stimulus about right? That would be a perfectly reasonable discussion. Whereas all this stuff about the coming collapse of China and the crash is just fantasy. Yeah, we go back to where we started. Harvey, do you have anything to add there? No, I thought that this is a very interesting discussion. And it shows that uh, if you seek truth from facts, that you're going to get a clearer picture than if you uh, believe the propaganda and the messages that are put out that are designed to, in this case, uh, put China down and create a picture that doesn't actually exist. Mm -hmm. So I come away from this discussion knowing that the problem is not as big as people in the West think it is, mm -hmm. and that while my solution, like a Peace Corps, is only a very small piece of this, and, it, and I come at it from the psychological dimension, I'm very pleased about uh, what I learned today, and I hope the audience will be too. Me too. And I, I don't think uh, the decision makers in this country will be swayed by those doomsayers, and, but what they need to do, it's up to them to make the decision. And with that, we wrap up today's chat. Many thanks to... John Ross, Senior Fellow at Chongyang Institute for Financial Studies, Shenmin University of China. Harvey Zodin, Senior Fellow at the Center for China and Globalization. And Chen Jiahe, Chief Investment Officer of Beijing-based Novem RK Technologies, for sharing your insights. And the show is available on all major podcast platforms. If you've got anything to say about the topic or the show, feel free to leave a message or drop us an email at radio at cgtn.com. I'm Tuyin, saying thank you for being with us. We'll have more chat next week. From the first day I was here, I just love China. Why as well. China instead of other countries? That's the essence of China. Why the village instead of the city? When we talk about Shangsun Jinxin, you know, rural revitalization. As China's rural revitalization continues, we talk to expats to find out their reasons for choosing to live in the country's villages for years or even decades. Everyone knew and everyone cared about See around them, people investing in that. They also share their experiences and views on the development and reconstruction of the countryside over the years. The village became much cleaner. So that was the best thing because all the families got back together. Learn more about what's going on in China's vast rural areas through my expat life in rural China, here on Chat Lounge.
With a history of 5,000 years, it's no surprise that China has created a fabulous treasury of folk tales. Once a year, on the seventh day of the seventh month, all the magpies fly up to heaven and form a bridge. So many amazing worlds to discover. I want a new palace, said King Mu of Zhou one day. Chinese folk tales retold for audiences today. Will, will you marry me? He asked. And with little hesitation, she said, <laughs> Yes. 5,000 years of amazing Chinese folk tales. My father must not go to war. Someone must take his place. You'll find Chinese Folk Tales Season 3 wherever you discover your favorite podcasts.